Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Wednesday, October 19th, 2022. It's great to be back once again with Professor Michael Gurness. Mike, as always, great to be with you. Thanks for joining me. You're very welcome, David. It's great to be here. Mike, today I want to pick up something that we talked about in our very first conversation, but now we can talk about it in the historical narrative. When you were named or decided to become Seismolab director, you know, with your appreciation of history and the rich heritage of the Seismolab, were there any particular directors in the Seismolab's past that you wanted to emulate or that had particular leadership styles that spoke to you? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I mean, I think all... I mean, most of the directors that I knew, right? So I guess in some sense, I knew, I knew um, four directors extremely well, uh, Don Anderson, uh, Don Helmberger, Hiro Kanemori, and Yeroen Trump, and Yeroen and I are more contemporaries. Um, I think, uh, you know, maybe Don Anderson in the sense that he was a bit, uh, I've been quite hands off and I, I think he was too, in the sense that uh, I don't, I didn't want to uh, like steer the direction of the lab in any of my, in, a, in my personal direction. I mean, my own feeling is to sort of uh, get the best people and then just symbiotically the group just evolves forward on, on its own. So I sort of have a very different view of the lab than I have of my own research program, okay? And especially when I was uh, younger and mid-career where, you know, it was absolutely, you know, it's kind of like steering absolutely, I want to go in this direction. We're going to go in this direction and just throwing all the, the power in there. I tend to view there. I mean, there's two views of the seismological laboratory. I think maybe I'm sure there's more than two views, but um, there's the naive view and there's probably the external but non-scientific view and, you know, and we're sort of a, a seismic monitoring uh, group right? That's what we do. We, we study earthquakes in Southern California and we monitor them and we report on them. It's a very narrow view. I tend to view that although it's a logistically, it's a huge undertaking and we do it with, with great skill and great success. But that's one view. And the other view is that we are a group of, uh, of scientists, a small group of scientists who communally sort of work together. And to me, that's the most important thing about the Seismolab um, in the sense that uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an open environment and it's one with enormous amount of collaboration. Now, interestingly enough, I need to point out that the GPS division overall has uh, has historically and been viewed as a place by the national community of of one in which people will work together and they'll work together in, in a way that both transcends traditional boundaries and that those and that transcending actually leads to something very important. Um, and I mean, where, where we often see this is, I can speak of this uh, in generic terms as a senior faculty member here, is that um, when we get commentaries back from other academics who write to us, either they are evaluating someone we're gonna hire or maybe a person has been come up for promotion and they'll see that there's been this change in the person's career, right? you know, they were only uh, a modeler and they became, you know, very interested in the real world, right? And this has actually happened repeatedly within geophysics. Um, Don Helmberger is perhaps the greatest example in 
all of seismology. But um, and and I think the seismo lab is an embodiment of that, but it's an embodiment of that as a as a you know, perhaps more focused uh, on geophysics, and it is you know clearly more, way more communal uh, in that in that regard. So, you know, and in some sense, they say this this is supposed to be a hallmark of Caltech, right? And so I think that Cal the Seismo Lab really um, stands up for these things. And so, as I've mentioned before in previous discussions, I mean. I mean, some people want to make things gigantic and uh, you know, bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and uh, certainly not not the view of Caltech, and it's not the view of the Seismo Lab. I mean, clearly there's big groups now around campus that it becomes really giganticized, but you know, the Seismo I view the Seismo Lab as something more uh, on a human scale in which people uh, work with one another. And I, and I think that's the most important thing. I think as director, you know, that to me, that's, that's key. Right. And I hear repeatedly individuals who try to create some sort of a communal kind of an environment. Right. Um, like for example, I mean, over the decades uh, we would see, um, We'd have like, you know, very prominent, I won't mention any name, very prominent geophysicists coming from very nice universities within the United States and would go down to coffee. And sometimes they'd say, well, how do you do this? You know, I tried to have tea at our place and it just fizzled and it never worked. And, and so my feeling has been that that is that communal and that sharing is really it's um, it's important, and that that to me is the most important thing. And Mike, it's always been one of the narratives that I you know come to appreciate about the Seismo Lab within GPS and Caltech are the push and pull factors about how much the Seismo Lab should be integrated more generally within GPS and where it should be not an island. That's not the right word, but where it should retain some of its discreteness or cohesiveness that existed physically and metaphorically when it was up in the, the San Rafael Hills. I wonder... It's attention. Yeah, yeah. I... It's attention. And I felt that as, a, as, a, as just a faculty member here, uh, probably even as director. And so when it you used became... to be stronger. Oh, when, go ahead. Go when ahead. you became director and you, 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 you felt this tension yourself, how do you navigate that? What what has been the right balance where the Seismo Lab is its own organization, but seismology in its modern form, of course, must be intellectually and academically integrated more broadly in geophysics and planetary science? Yeah. So in some sense, the tension. I mean, right now, the geophysics faculty is just as integrated in the rest of the division as any other faculty members. But we have this extra kind of communal aspect of it. And so I, I, I think that um, the walls are not as, uh, as sharp as they were when I first came here in the mid-1980s with Don Anderson. Um, I mean, there was a... Uh, You know, at some level, there there could be tension. You sort of felt that there could be tension that that Don would have with the with the rest of the division, in the sense of, well, this is geophysics, and and we're going to do everything ourselves over here, and and. But in but in some sense, he, part of it is that sometimes people feel that there's like walls and things like that, but there really aren't. And and in some sense, here's a very interesting exchange that I had, I won't mention anything, but I, and I don't know if, if anyways, it was a, some external, um, it was some external uh, review, perhaps, of the division and a, and a question, you know, and they were questioning me about geophysics and the, and the, and the seismal lab. And, um, and one of the external reviewers asked says you know we were meeting with students and you know what 
they feel really excluded. I mean, what is, you know, it's almost like, well, what's your problem? Uh, you're excluding people. And boy, to me, it was like, no, we don't actually exclude anyone. It turns out we have all these things that we do together, right? And it just happens we do them all together. And well, the, the fact is that you may be outside of the seismology. It's not like that we put a wall up so that you can't get in. I mean, clearly, I mean, coffee used to be always open to anyone who would want to come from the division, right? And and so, but, you know, that doesn't mean it, people would come in a sustained way uh, from out the division because the topic of discussion would maybe not be what they would be interested in. But the point is sometimes if something, if you're creating all of these things that work well, you know, you have the coffee, you're sharing students, um, you have seminars, maybe we do trips together. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, it's, it's there to create a wall. It's to create what they tell us to do anyways. And that is to create a dynamic environment where people work together. And that's what we've created. And so people work together. And so, you know, you can sort of view that there's a wall, but it wasn't like, oh, we're going to create a wall and plaster in here. I mean, it's interesting. People from all over the division will walk over here and get free coffee, right? I've done that for 20 years. When I first came here, you had to be part of what was called Coffee Club. and uh, But I decided that was kind of like a waste of everyone's activity and just bought the coffee machine and a contract with a contractor. And they just, and they just, the coffee machine's there. Anyone can come over here. And actually, they used to, and I actually, this is something, I mean, it sounds very, very trivial, but it was really important for for people more than i had thought is um for a while they still do or maybe right now it's temporarily put on hold but um someone would get coffee and we want not coffee but donuts once a week right and they get all these donuts and they put them in the coffee room well very few people would bring those into the coffee room where we would have our discussions uh, but there was there and anyone could walk over here and you, know, you could just see people from the division walking over and getting their free donuts, whatever day it was, get their free jelly donuts. And so the point was, you just, we're just doing things right. And without, you know, be them social activities, uh, refreshments and things like that. And that, that, um, I mean, the division does this too, but none of the other groups do it per se, just you know, they may do it at a division level, um, offers things like that, or attempt to try to do things like that, but they often will fizzle out after a while. Um, but no, I mean, it's, um, I don't, you know, I, you know, like over the years, I've collaborated a lot with uh, Paul Asimo, you know, and, and in some sense, you know, he's not re he's not part of the seismo lab, right? He doesn't feel part of the seismo lab. He's in geochemistry and in geology and things like that, and that's fine. We just work with him, you know, share projects and students. Jennifer Jackson, same way, um, you know. And it's so it it's it's the thing is we have something here that's very helpful, right? But it doesn't you know cut us off from from the rest of the the world, you know. So, and I, and I think that's really good. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel, it's just comfortable here, right? Because anyways, all those kind of interactions that people have um, throughout the division, they're, they're much more, okay, maybe you have a, a meeting every couple of weeks or something like that, right? Or, you know, you have a seminar and you go and your seminar, the thing is everything is sort of like here. And so, you know, all the faculty and the students are right up in this small hallway, right? And we're all here together. And we go downstairs and then there's coffee. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I I don't know if I'm addressing this whole issue of the, the, the tension and things like that. Um, I think I, I had heard this um, many, many, many years ago. And it was a, a story that probably goes back to when Don Anderson was the director, but maybe even before that, is um, one of the complaints that people would have is why the administration never put forward a major campaign for endowment uh, 
of and endowment funds. And the argument that was told to me that, well, the provost had decided that because it didn't want to make the director more powerful than the division chairman, right? Well, since that time, of course, the division chairman had become extremely powerful and have lots of resources, but by the same token, now they do endow nearly all center directors have some endowment funds, including the seismic lab. So, you know, so now I think if there's less, now that a model has been established throughout the Institute by which this happens, um, you know, and now, you know, the seismic lab is not in some sense unique. It may be the oldest, it may be the one that has the most cohesion to it, but you know, there are other centers now within the division, right. That are probably more or less, uh, like permanent, like the Linde Center, right? That's a more permanent, I view. And not to be contrasted with what the Seismolab had created back in the, near the turn of the century of the Tectonics Observatory, which many of us had viewed as a, a project, right? Even though we called it an observatory, we called, it was a project and it was a successful project and it came and it went. Um, and, and of course, when the funding goes, since you know two thirds of that were the seismic lab, anyways, um, it just vanished. Yeah. Mike, I asked about the seismic lab within GPS. What about more broadly across the institute? Just how computation is a connecting point that that brings together all kinds of different disciplines. Did you see opportunity, particularly in your interest and expertise in, in high-powered computing, to bring in, for example, partnerships with CMS? Yeah. Um, well, the interesting thing about that is that it has evolved dramatically, right? And so let's contrast two, two different two different things, uh, the way things were in the 1990s and the things that are in this half decade right now. So back then in the, in the, in the nineties, there was a, there were several groups on campus. Uh, there were several of us within geophysics, you know, that knew that was the, we were developing our own software and we needed our own we thought we needed our own hardware. Well, we definitely needed our own hardware, but who, you know, where was that hardware going to be? And so there was a clear desire um, to, you know, to, to continue to develop our own actual hardware within the Seismo Lab or to develop more broadly within the Institute. Um, you know, I was part of this group in the 90s it was called the Center for Advanced Computer Research, CACAR. It came and went. Uh, eventually, the Hypercube project, uh, which was the uh, evolution of the parallel computing uh, project after the parallel computer got invented, and we created this CACAR a couple of years before I joined the faculty, and then I was part of this group. I mean, one of the big desires of that group, of course, was to get a big computer. And for a while, Cal and as I spoken about in earlier times, uh, there was a real desire to get these big, big iron as, as we called them at the time. It's a word that's gone out of, uh, it was no longer used for the last several decades, but several decades ago, it was a word. And so that, and at the time, a, a single university for the university's needs, in fact, could get such a large computer, right? Caltech had several of them. As, as I spoke about. And so there was a clear desire, especially among Jeroen Trump and myself to do that, right? To do that either within the, in the end, the first way we did it, we did it just within the seismic lab. We talked in great detail about that. And then there were other groups on campus who wanted to do that as well. But what happened is that the way it evolved at a national level, it was no longer an interest of Caltech to do that because it, it became more and more of a service activity for those supercomputer centers. And it wasn't really clear that the extent to which there would be a dramatic, you know, advantage to the host university. I do think there are advantages of it. And several universities 
went that route. The University of Texas at Austin, uh, up until a couple of years ago, the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, they hosted these big, this big iron, and it did give their their faculties, um, you know, extra access to this. Um, but now it's less and less the case, right? And although some universities continue to compete in that. And so now for me, that's all commodity in the sense, in the sense that um, I compete within and other people in my area of high performance computing, we compete within that arena. So, you know, in some sense, the peak of that had happened probably in the 90s. And then just the way technology, the funding of science evolved, that became less of a focal point around campus, I would say. Okay, then things evolved and, you know, and then suddenly, you know, the, you know, 2015, or, you know, maybe 2014, and then to the present day have come around. And the research that was done in CMS and some of the faculty members there, and suddenly, especially for the work of Zach Ross, it became clear that uh, you know, the, the software and the algorithms were absolutely key in machine learning, right? And he was at the cutting edge of that. And so that's very, very, very important, okay? I'm not actually participating at that at all. And I don't think outside of Zach, um, others are actually involved with that kind of interdisciplinary research. Now, as you probably see all over, you see it all over the Institute. One of the things we see is the application of machine learning to anyone who has big data. But what I see almost exclusively, not exclusively, but what I see widely deployed are just, um, are just the same stuff, the same tools that have been broadly developed are now reapplied to a new area of science, right? And so the graduate students, in fact, the students with the undergraduate training here at Caltech or at other nice universities have a nice training in this at the undergraduate level if they're getting a computer science degree. And they can take these algorithms and, and rapidly apply them to any area of, of big science. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, I think that there's these synergies that exist amongst a few faculty in CMS and then around the Institute. And Zach is one of those kind of like focal points within the Seismo lab. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it has almost become so widely applied, right? That it's, um, yeah, it, yeah, it's interesting. So, I mean, are there going to be other areas of, of seismology and the seismo lab that will actually take advantage of that? Almost certainly in the work of Zhongwen Zan, it will almost certainly require, you know, you know, algorithms and ability to deal with big data beyond anything that we can currently work with now because of all the work that he does with the fiber optics. And so, the rate limiting factor there is probably going to be algorithms going down down the right. And I su suppose that a lot of the seismic lab students are really going to need to pick up pick up on this um, if if that continues to evolve in the way it's it's evolving. Mike, but yeah, you, it's sort of as you emphasized um, when you became director, you did not want to sort of impute your own research interests on what the Seismo Lab should yeah, be doing. Yeah, but there's a reason for that, okay? There's a reason for that, and and that is because my own personal research, either being in the computational science or the stuff that really sets me apart with all my colleagues, which is the interface between geology and computational science, that is so different than what what most people do within the seismo lab that I'm not going to bring the seismo lab in this kind of like direction. I don't, I'm not that arrogant to believe that that's the purpose. I mean, there's bigger purposes of, of, uh, of, of, 
of scientific organization than just to promote your own work. And um, so it's come at an, a huge expense, I think, of my own research, unfortunately. Um, but that's okay. To flip that question around, of course, that's exactly the right leadership approach that you're not imposing anything based on your own research interests. But what about going the other way? When you became director of the Seismolab and in the years since, did that give you a broader angle vantage point where you were seeing more things that were happening and those things might have influenced no, your research? No, I was research? already seeing things broadly. No, it yeah. didn't. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, not at all. Uh, I had already, I mean, I mean, maybe if I had been younger, I, it would have, but no, not at my age. It, it didn't. And part of the reason for that, and I could have done things differently. So actually one thing I did consciously at the time and, to be honest with you, I I have thought that maybe this was the was not the right way to do things, but um, I was leading this national effort in you know we, it was in my area of geodynamics initially we called it the CIG the Computational Infrastructure for Geodynamics and it became a model for software institutes within the NSF. But actually what it evolved into was really a software center for high performance computing for geophysics within the, for the US university researchers. That's what I evolved it into. Um, and even though it had the name of geodynamics, it actually was bigger, bigger than that. Um, and I thought right at the beginning, it says, well, you know, I could, because I had this option now of just folding it all into the Seismolab, right? And probably most people would have done that, right? And, um, but to me, I sort of viewed that as, I viewed it as counterproductive, right? Mm -hmm. I thought that the National Center was really for the national community, mm -hmm. right? And so why should I dominate that? And, uh, you know, to me, it, it seemed uh, it was arrogant and it, it was not the right direction. And in the end, I, and actually there was another reason I actually saw that my own community was going in one direction and I wanted to get freed of that. And I wanted to go in a different direction. And, um, and so, and that actually had, that, we already spoken about that. And I wanted to take my own area of geodynamics into the direction of inverse problems, whereas the community was still steadfastly into the forward physics problems and remains that way, uh, even though we've done all this work, cleaved it off. Um, you know, that's for another younger scientist to have that whole, maybe we were ahead of our times, but, um, so yeah, so I, I could have done this. And so that would have been the normal thing. And there would have been several advantages of that. There was lots of NSF funding. There would have been, you know, we clearly would have been a focal point, um, of, of computational geophysics within the United States. But then there's also another non caltech kind of element to it all. Uh, and that is the service the service part, right? I think the service part is absolutely very, very, very important, right? But then I thought that, well, is, is it going to, could it, you know, bog us down, right? So I decided not, so I decided that I would give it up and let the community take it from there. Um, and then, of course, as you're aware, then I eventually took on the same role but more more from an administrative perspective than an intellectual perspective of uh, trying to uh, create uh, software development and you know a, you know a way to broadly develop software across all areas of science on, over Caltech and that's the software academy but um, and again it has a has a lot of overlap with what we had done uh you know two decades earlier for geophysics now you know that became sort of um you know necessary for more science more broadly um 
and again, it has a different, very, very different flavor to it all. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, yeah. Um, Mike, with only so many hours in the day and all of the new administrative responsibilities that you took on over the past 12 years, did that force a certain narrowing or prioritization in your research agenda to figure out what's most important to me, given that I only have so many, so much time to work on the things that, that I can do in science? Um, yeah, well, it, it came at a huge expense. Uh, and unfortunately, you know, you know, the way things unfold, sometimes they don't unfold in, in the most optimal way because several other things unfolded at exactly at that unfolded concurrently that were very successful for my own research, but yet it also caused even a more dilution of the, of the kind of activities. It's something that goes through my mind now all the time, but you know, actually a, a decade ago, didn't, didn't so much. It was just more like, well, I would take on things and just keep charging. And then some things uh, just naturally fell, fell by the wayside. Um, yeah. So, you know, obviously with students i've tended to focus more on some things than on than on other things i mean for me personally which was ended up being a great great success but it more affected myself as an individual scientist not as a as a as a leader of my own group and that was this sort of divergence of activities off into the marine work and going on oceanographic expeditions and my all the work I had done with the ocean drilling program. And that had come about because there was a natural kind of evolution that I was pushing my science to very, very slowly over the previous years, going all the way back to the early part of the century, where you know, in, in, within several different veins, we had brought the science of geodynamics to the point where, and tr specifically trying to understand the underpinnings of plate tectonics, was that there were some big questions that I wanted to sort of address and that I couldn't address. No one else was addressing them from an observational perspective. I had taken the models to the point where they needed to be tested. And I didn't see other people doing that. And so I needed to step forward um, within that whole community of especially ocean, initially ocean drilling to test my ideas. And that was, so the big thing that I got, uh, got off on in terms of the research direction was the whole question of how to make a new subduction zone. So that sounds like, okay, well, it's a particular thing, but there was a very specific, in terms of the dynamics of the earth, why this was so important is that this process of subduction is, you know, well, it creates most natural hazards. It creates most geology on the planet. And uh, it also is the place in terms of the whole energetics of the planet as a dynamic system. It's the key place on the planet where you have the tectonic plates returning to the Earth's interior, from a physics perspective and an energetics perspective, I mean, all the activity happens in some sense in one spot in terms of the, you know, the forces which drive the system and then the dissipation in the system. And then in that process there, there was always this outstanding question, well, how did it start? Well, people are very interested in how this started you know, over in Earth history, because it didn't exist several billion years ago. And uh, so, and that's a focus of enormous discussion within the scientific community. Oh, when did subduction first begin? But yet, no one knew the answer of even as the Earth continues to evolve, oh, why does a new subduction zone form today? No one even knew the answer to that question. And so, and so if you go back, you know, when I first started to get interested in this question, off and on, fits and starts, at the turn of the century, we first wrote our first paper on this. Uh, you know, no one else was working on it, and 
And, but then quickly we realized that there weren't the necessary observations to test the models. And so it required going out and not in geophysics, but in terms of geology to start to collect the data that was required. And so with other people in the community and sometimes by myself, by myself, you know, I had to go then compete with trying to articulate the need for ocean of these particular drilling expeditions. And, um, and then, and they were in the pot for a while. And then all of a sudden, every, all the stuff hit the fan within a short period of time in, oh, geez, I even lost track of time now. Uh, you know, I don't even know, 2010 or something like that. And then suddenly a lot of things got approved all at the same time. And I found myself, oh my gosh. And, um, and then, yeah, so funny. It's so funny. I mean, there's, I mean, I can, how, I don't know if you ever find this, but something, or if other people tell you this, David, but sometimes I can, within certain activities, have a perfect sequence of events, but then sometimes I can't connect it to actually what the date was, right? And um, so I want to give you some specific dates here, um, if you don't mind. Please. Uh, yeah. So um, specifically, a lot of stuff sort of like hit the fan. Although I do want to go back also and tell you something else here with Joanne Stock that she gave me an incredible opportunity uh, in terms of research. Um, but no, the, the stuff that really sort of hit the fan was in 20, 2014. Um, so in the Western Pacific, there are these two gigantic subduction zones. One is south of Japan. And uh, I mean, most people think about it as the Mariana subduction zone. There are this place in the Western Pacific called the Challenger Deep. It's the deepest point in the surface of the earth. And that's connected to this subduction zone. And then there's one north of New Zealand. Uh, it's called the Tonga Kermadec subduction zone. And they both formed at 50 million years ago. We sort of generally knew that. And, uh, but we didn't know how they formed. But there was so much missing geology that we needed to, to do. And it's very expensive to sort of mount one of these expeditions. Um, and so I got involved with a big project. It was called Project IBM, uh, tongue in cheek. I, B, M, Iso, Bonin, Marianas. It's the whole plate margin that goes from just south of Tokyo all the way down to Guam is the Izu, Bonin, Mariana subduction zone. And it formed geologically 50 million years ago. But I became part of this bigger project that, uh, you know, probably like 20, 2005, 2008, I don't know exactly when. And it was called Project IBM. And we were going to have four drilling expeditions to try to understand this and many other besides subduction initiation. It was kind of like in there. And uh, and it was not going anywhere for a while. Blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, I took one of those expeditions and I was able to specifically turn it around to test an idea that I had on subduction initiation. And then as soon as I did that, that proposal then just flew through the system and then it brought everything else behind it. That's how my view of it. But I was on the panels and I could see that sort of like the things had broken forward. And then eventually that got, and I had never done any of this kind of stuff. I had pieced together stories from the ocean drilling program ever since I was a postdoc here. Uh, in the 80s, and I would just read these books and get all this information about the geological history of the Pacific from these things. And then all of a sudden, now all of a sudden, I was one of the proponents. I wasn't the chief scientist or anything like that. And uh, But then almost as this thing got approved, I was working with another very close colleague to study the one south of New Zealand. And that got approved, right? And then... 
So then I started to go out to see. So I went out to see. I spent six months at sea over a period of like two and a half years uh, on this drill ship, drilling south of Japan. We also, for some of my other ideas, we drilled on the northwest shelf of Australia, and then we drilled north of New Zealand. And uh, so it turned out that all of these expeditions were extraordinarily successful, right? And and it helped in a synthesis of the. And now it's like everyone and their mother's uncle is working on the subduction initiation business now. So I gotta like get out of it and do something else. Um, but in any event, I only brought this up because I know you didn't want to take the discussion in this particular That's way. Okay. <laughs> but um, on having to do with having a limited amount of time and and as you get older and you have more responsibilities, you can't take on you just can't do as much and you got to figure out if you're going to do anything before you leave, you know, how are you going to do that? And so then all of the research went off in this kind of like direction. And the crazy thing is, so when I was proposing all of this, so that was like at the end of, I don't know when the proposals first went in, I don't know, 2006, the 2008, but by the first drilling was in 2014. Um, and, but the interesting thing is just several years before that, you know, I had also developed this other collaboration. We had talked about this in high performance computing and I, and, and, you know, having to do with these really super high resolution forward models to understand the dynamics of plate tectonics. That research also unfolded. Um, and it was like, and the funny thing is during the course of this on things that just, just happen as an individual scientist, my research through collaborations has gotten more and more dirty in the sense of so close, closer to the geology than I had ever gotten before on the one hand. And then on the other hand, with other collaborators, like in a different universe, this brain versus that brain, I had gone off in this other direction on trying to, you know, work with mathematicians, developing new algorithms before we would just invent our own algorithms or read something in a book that applied mathematician had written years before and apply it to our codes. Now we were collaborating directly, you know, especially with my close colleague, Georg Stadler, who's at the Courant Institute. You know, it's like the research went, got down and dirty for geology for part of the problem and it got really mathematical on the other side. This is like, uh, it was probably the worst, stupidest thing I've ever done in my life, right? To go off in these different directions but there is a there is method to all of this madness right for all of those things they still come down to how plate tectonics works and trying to figure out how to how to either create the observations or how to create the computational underpinning to sort of solve the problem so it's still all to try to solve the same problem but from entirely different directions and of course, these are all lots and lots of people, right? Still a number of students over the years, you know, with, you know, the student in me, student in me as on a paper, writing many, many papers like that. But then these broader, bigger teams, you know, gigantic. There was a time in there with the NSF that uh, you had to have all these conflicts of interest. They want to know who you collaborated with and on a project with or wrote a paper with. I mean, there was a, there was a time in there that that I had people on there from th each the number of scientists on those drilling expeditions is thirty. Then over three years, at ninety, right? I mean, to just keep track of the now NSF, you supply this as a as a Excel spreadsheet. But it got so out of control in there for a while. There was so many people out there that I 
was interacting with on on those things. But at the same time, we had a big team trying to go forward on the computational science side of things. Yeah, I, I, I'm just trying to to simmer all this down so um, so there's a little bit more method to the madness. Um, although we've taken things off in yet a new direction too with Nadia Lapusta. So I guess I forget about that. <laughs> Mike, in previous conversations, you conveyed your enthusiasm for what Zach and, and Zhang Wen are doing as really some of the most impressive work that's happening in seismology anywhere. It's and totally it's, disconnected to me, but it's just wonderful work. And you're I just so proud of the it. fact that they're at the Seismolab. So my question there is, how much of that pride and excitement is about how scholars like Zach and Zhang Wen you know, they could be at a Harvard, they could be at an MIT, but they're here. And how much of that is specific because they're just so representative of what the Seismolab has always been, which is at the cutting edge? I wonder if you can disentangle that a little bit for me. Yeah, that that's a very good question. Um, well, you know, we, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out who to hire, right? And sometimes you just see that there's a, there's a great fit. Um, with individuals and it's not, you know, and it's a two, it's a several stage process, right? It's the existing faculty within, this is how it's worked my whole time. Maybe it's going to evolve in a different direction in the future, but the way it works has been, well, the group, be it the option or several options have clearly identified, well, that's a good person. And so there's always there's several different aspects of that. One is um, that they're that they're a very good scientist, right? And that they're very creative, and they have the the ability to to develop the program. But then there's another aspect, right? That's really played a very important role. I think probably in the division, but especially in the seismic lab. Well, is that person going to be a good fit? I mean, you don't sort of like ask that question, but you sort of just, you, you sort of feel it and it, and it just drives you forward. It's, that's the person I want because you just feel it like that's a good person to have here. And it, the kind of people, yeah. And the other reason why they've been so successful in the, sort of the seismic lab tradition and what makes it work so well is they sort of, well, Zhang Wen grew up here, right? I mean, he got his PhD here and he spent two years away and then he came back as an assistant professor and scripts didn't, you know, destroy him. Sorry, they scripts is a wonderful place and I have great respect for all my colleagues. It's, I know the ones in geophysics especially and I have great respect for them. So that was a tongue in cheek joke, uh, but, um, but the point is, he wasn't away enough to 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 know that you know he just wants to build his own research group and he wants to create an empire. But he wants to do a, have a research program, lots of students. But he's quite willing to work with the within the soup, right? And um, and Zach, of course, I mean, he was here for three years as a postdoc before we hired him. Maybe he was two years. I forget. Um, it probably was only two years. It just seems like he did so much. That's why I said three years. <laughs> Maybe he was there for one year. Uh, but he did a mountain of stuff before he was appointed to the regular faculty. Um, but it was such a natural fit. I mean, I it was just one. I mean, Zach was, I mean, he was doing totally different things than I was, right? But I would be talking to him all the time, right? About what he was working on when he was a postdoc. And you just sort of felt that that's the kind of person we want here. And I think the other faculty did as well. Well, that's an argument that won't work very well without necessarily in the whole division or Caltech. I mean, they have to basically be, you know, on the all the other things. They're going to look at the comp, they're going to look at the papers. They're going to read the letters that the international community was going to write about these people, even when they're young. But no, it's just identifying the right people, right? It's just identifying the right people, right? And like Jennifer Jackson has fit into the Seismo Lab, just she's been one of the most wonderful colleagues I've ever had my whole career. 
and she's in an area of mineral physics. And uh, we wanted to hire a person in mineral physics for ages. And I, we weren't even really searching anymore at this point, you know, and, but we knew this is somewhere. And we would bring in people all the time and we'd bring in all these brilliant people. And, you know, but we, no one can communicate with them at some level. And so they didn't seem like a good match. And then one day, Jennifer Jackson walked through the door and she gave this seminar. And one of the things we had already identified was she was at the absolute cutting edge of using um, these advanced uh, photon sources to do this very, very high resolution uh, mass power spectroscopy to understand the vibrational state of the atoms under high pressures and temperatures. She was absolutely doing that thing. And, uh, you know, but yet when she walked in, she just immediately was excited by the fact that everyone was talking to each other and we were very interested in what is the meaning of your stuff for what we're doing. And it was just, and, and just that was it. Then we hired her immediately right away, right? She was going to go to some other university, had already signed up, but, and she did, wasn't even coming here for an interview and she just walked through the door, but then we figured it out and we got her here. And so that's the way it is. I mean, we take a long time to, to find people and, um, and when they're a good fit, you sort of know it and, uh, and it works and it works out really well. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. The Seismolab probably, you know, if you go back, you know, 50 years probably had a bigger turnover than other parts of the division. They would bring a lot of people in and they would leave and things like that. I don't know why um, they left. A lot of these people are before me. Very few people have, well, people have left when I was here. I understand all the reasons, but generally they had nothing to do with Caltech or um, the kind of intellectual environment that we offered people. It had a lot, essentially everything had to do with other other things because we're all human beings and have a life and um so yeah mike for the last part of our talk i want to ask two broadly conceived questions one retrospective one looking to the future so if you survey your career both on the science and the administrative side where do you think you've moved the needle the most where have you had the greatest impact both on the geophysics and in the community of seismology and supporting your colleagues to always improve the field? Yeah, so I think those, I have two, two answers to that because there's, there's, I think those are two different questions, what I did personally as a scientist. So I think the most important stuff I did in terms of changing science um, was... Um, was this whole bringing together of the dynamics of the planet with the sedimentary record. I mean, I think that, I think I changed, I mean, ultimately the whole field changed the course of the connection between sea level and sediments and uh, the kind of things that we see that we can perceive that the continents and other plates have done in terms of vertical motions. And, you know, before plate tectonics, you go all the way back to the fifties, it goes from the 1950s or maybe from the early 1960s, all the way back to the mid uh, 19th century. Geology was about vertical tectonics. Then in 1966 to 1969, plate tectonics was discovered and all became about horizontal and everyone worked on horizontal tectonics and that's what everyone did. But what geodynamics was able to do, and I think my work was quite pioneering in this whole direction, was to bring these two views of the earth together and resolve the big questions of long-term sea level change and how the dynamics of the interior of the planet relate really to the geological record. I think now it's a whole gigantic field. A lot of people will do duplicative things up the wazoo, um, you know, in the decades since. But I think that's the biggest 
change I did scientifically, right? And so probably by the time I was an associate professor that um, the, you know, or when I had my early years as a full professor, um, that was mostly done. Um, I think mostly it has to be clean up at this particular, that's why I don't work on it primarily. There's very little work I do on that area anymore. Now, in terms of geophysics and changing the course of geophysics and seismology, I think what I tried to do, um, and Don Helmberger and I tried to do that, was to bring a physics oriented view of processes for Earth, the Earth together with the seismic wave field. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, we didn't really bring all of geophysics with us. I don't. I don't think that 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 really happened. That we. I don't think we really. People continued to do what they always did, uh, but we tried to do it right. And I think that was the right, the right thing, the right thing to actually do. Um, and I'm trying to do several other things now. And for my own research scientifically, what the big thing I want to do is I want to bring the whole cycle of great earthquakes together with the actual motion of the plates. I don't want to view this, it's a big area, it's a hot topic now, but it's all viewed in one direction. It's all about the big earthquakes. It says, ah, plates move like this. I drive, it's going to drive the great earthquakes like that. I actually view that these are, they're way more bent coupled together in terms of the physics and doing the physics properly. And that's what I'm trying to do with this new direction with Nadia Lapusta. And uh, so we have students here and then we're assembling a team to do this big, big thing. And it's a, um, from the computational side of things, it's beyond anything we've ever done before. And so it's going to be a big team that Nadi and I will be involved in with in terms of computational scientists and applied mathematicians. So that's what I wanna, that's the one of the big things. If I could do that before I can't do anything anymore, scientifically, that's what I wanna do. But I have to get rid of a lot of things, no more director of this or that, and carve off a lot of other things so they can sort of focus on that one. Something to look forward to. Yeah. Is that a good way to end? Well, no. One more question oh. looking to the future, <laughs> just on this basis. Oh, that was, the few, that was my own scientific future. No, I know. But so, but if I can put a finer point on that, you made a very... One minute, because I actually do have a hard... All right. So hard. really, really quick. Yeah. In, in the previous conversation, you made this very interesting point that, you know, the work you're doing with Nadia right now, you might get laughed out of the room, but you don't care, right? I wonder if you can contextualize that with the Seismolab's long history of forward-looking science that the rest of the field had to catch up to so that you were no longer getting laughed out of the room. I wonder how you might see that in historical perspective. Yeah, I don't know where things are going there. I mean, I, it could be a total, maybe nothing will happen of it. I mean, I, I that's a very dangerous direction to think about. Uh, I think you know, you never know if anything's ever transformative until after the fact. So that's the kind of thing. NSF asks us to propose transformative research. Well, everyone thinks our research is transformative. That's why they do it. But you never really know that, right, until after the fact. And you can clearly see, ah, that was transformative. Uh, but it's all in hindsight. It's never in to the future. So I think actually, David, that's too dangerous as a scientist to, to think about. I'm just, I have a what I'm trying to do right now, and uh, I'm hoping to to go forward with that uh, in in the future. But you know, scientists working together, um, in this case, geophysicists working together um, with data and models and theory, and I, I I think that's that's a big mashup. I think that's uh, remains the core of the future of geophysics is this blend between theory and observation and computation and uh, having people work with one another. If it's whatever problem it is, if it's for the dynamics of the whole planet, how an individual earthquake works or how other, other geophysical processes work on the earth or other planets, I think 
that's the direction. Mike, this has been a terrific series of conversations. I'm so glad we were able to do this. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome.